Good morning to our esteemed speaker for the day, Professor Bhunia, on behalf of the Association of Food Scientists and Technologists for India, the Mumbai chapter. Uh, my name is Subha Nishtala, I'm the president of the chapter, and I'm delighted that uh, all of you have joined us today in our annual lecture series, the memorial lecture for Professor Dr. J.V. Bhatt. Uh, we conduct this uh, memorial lecture every year in the month of July. And uh, it is our fond remembrance of one of the finest microbiologists uh, for India who's been an exemplary scientist, teacher, and uh, inspiration to many of us. We are delighted that uh, in today's session, we have uh, uh, many of our past presidents joining in to offer their support. I see Dr. Lele Ma'am, Dr. Warrior, Dr. Yadav, Many of our advisory council, uh, Professor Bandekar, I see Sangat Saab, and all the office bearers, uh, Nilesh Lele, I don't count Nilesh as past president as yet, he's pretty much part of the team still. Welcome, Nilesh, and uh, thank you for all the support for this program. Ritesh, Chinmay, all the participants who've joined us, uh, we are delighted that today's lecture is being delivered by uh, somebody who's worked so closely in the Listeria monocytogene space, Professor Bunya. Uh, the lecture series for uh, Professor Dr. J.V. Bhatt, as uh, you all know, is, is microbiology related. And uh, a grateful thanks to Professor Kondekar for uh, connecting us with such an esteemed faculty for delivering this, this session. Uh, AFSC India and the Mumbai chapter, as all of you know, has always been very active in creating outreach programs. Uh, even during the pandemic, we've done a number of sessions to uh, on the online mode in order to continue our efforts to provide uh, science-based information and connect for industry, both in terms of new emerging technologies as well as the regulatory requirements for India and various other spaces. We look forward to your joining us for future sessions as well. Uh, we are looking at a series of programs for Nutrition Week coming up in September. And uh, we are also going to be soon launching a special video program uh, on Instagram, which will be on some of the uh, leading entrepreneurs in the food food. Uh, with that brief background on AFST, I am uh, delighted to welcome the warrior to give us. And uh, we are very, very happy that we are joined today by Professor Dr. S. G. Bhatt. But uh, Dr. Bhatt uh, has requested that we uh, deliver on his behalf his message. I invite Dr. S. V. Warrior, past president for AFST Mumbai, uh, former senior scientific officer and head for the Seafood Technology section of the Baba Atomic Research Center. Uh, sir is a PhD in biochemistry from University of Mumbai with over 42 years, uh, I believe, of experience and expert in the radiation preservation of fish and fishery products. He's been um, a leading academician as well and has also been part of various scientific panels for the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. So, warrior, sir, I request you to please uh, welcome Dr. S.G. Bhatt and also deliver his message for us. Thank you, Dr. Shubha, for the introduction. With uh, the permission from my very close friend, Dr. S.G. Bhatt, I am reading a message given by S.G. Bhatt Honorary Secretary of uh, Professor Tebi Pat Memorial Committee. Uh, welcome, Dr. S.G. But I am reading on your behalf and with your permission, your message. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I am pleased to convey my message as a people of Professor J.B. But during 1949 in Bombay, as I am one of the few students leaving to say how lucky and proud to tell that Professor Butt is a pioneer microbiologist and no one can forget his humor and a teacher of par excellence in research 
at a time it's merged funds to buy petri dishes, glasswares, chemicals, and autoclave, etc. It was only available for doing microbial research. Many students completed PhD degrees with his guidance at the University of Bombay. The FSC, in collaboration with Eureka Force, registered the memorial committee and conducted seminars and lectures in Bombay, Mysore, Bangalore, and Manipur. And these events are conducted on the birthday of uh, Professor J.B. Bhatt, that is on 3rd March. It is commendable that uh, Bombay chapter of AFST is organizing this lecture on the behalf of the Memorial Committee and eminent microbiologists from USA and many other countries and India are giving this lecture. Today, I am very happy that an eminent microbiologist uh -huh. Professor Arun Bunia of Ford University is going to speak on us, the Listeria monocyte, you know, monogenes, a global safety concern. Welcome, Dr. Arun Bunia. Thank you. Back to Shubha. Thank you so much, Dr. Warrior, uh, and Dr. Bhatt for that very warm message of encouragement to all of us. It is now my delight and honor to welcome Professor Dr. Prakash Kundekar. Uh, sir is an MD homeopathy, MD Ayurveda Ratna, a fellow of the Royal Society of Health London, honorary director for the Indian Institute of Naturopathy. Having worked with agro industries for over three decades, uh, he has been part of the Mumbai and Swarashtra uh, academic uh, circle as a medical practitioner as well, which he continues to do. A voracious traveler and uh, researcher, he presents papers and conducts workshops across a variety of continents, uh, always inspiring us with his energy and depth of knowledge. In India, he's conducted over 700 health management workshops. He's been invited by AICR Washington DC for the International Conference on Food Nutrition uh, every year since 2003 onwards. He has very many uh, awards that he's been received and he's uh, been a uh, visiting speaker at various universities such as Portland, University of Texas, Purdue, uh, and so on. Dr. Kondekar, sir, I request you to please uh, take over this session with a dual responsibility. Please uh, help us remember Professor J.B. Bhatt and share some of his contributions and also welcome our keynote speaker for today, Professor Kondekar. Thank you, Subhash, for the nice introduction. And I'm delighted to have this. Can you share the uh, screen to me? Rajasta, can you share the screen? Yes, I think she must be just putting it back. So are you sharing or do you want Prajakta to share? Uh, now I can see. Yeah. Yes. Now I Yes, sir. Your screen is visible. Yeah, and uh, you'll be admitting uh, people. Okay. So, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Warrior and Dr. Butt, uh, Dr. J. V. Butt was uh, really a mesmerizing professor, I can say whatever uh, I heard from uh, Dr. Ejibar. And uh, not many years we have privilege to have this lecture at AFST Mumbai. Sir. So Professor Janardhan Bhatt, born in uh, 1913 at Thalassery in Kerala, had early education at St. Alois College in Mangalore. And uh, during his year 30, 35 to 53, as a researcher and teacher at St. Xavier's College, and there only he obtained his uh, MSc degree. In 1953, he was awarded first Doctor of Science by Mumbai University 
in the field of microbiology. His research topics was on bacterial dissemination of the lactose and oxalate. Professor Bhatt was at Indian Institute of Science for about 20 years, first as the head of the fermentation technology laboratory, later as a professor and head of the department of the microbiology and pharmacology. During his stay at the institute, he was visiting scientists at the National Institute of Health, Bethesda, Maryland, in USA. Earlier, he had visited USA as a postdoctoral fellow to the University of California, Berkeley. On his retirement from Indian Institute of Science in 1973, Professor Bhatt joined Kathuva Medical College in Manipal as emeritus professor and the research director, the third up to 1980 at Kasturva Medical College and Academy of General Education in Manipur. Manipur with distinction. Dr. Bhatt was elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, Indian National Science Academy of New Delhi, and was a fellow of Royal Institute of Chemistry, UK. He had served as secretary of the current Science Association, Bangalore, and as a president of the Society of Food Scientists and Technologists. He was the president of the Association of Microbiologists of India. He had also served various research and research organizations, including Indian Council of Agriculture Research, Department of Science and Technology, and University Grants Commission the effect body of the education. He was also advisor to CFTRI Mysore. Professor Bhatt received a large number of awards, to name a few, Moose Medal in 1954, Hercule Medal from the Jekyll Arpia in 1955, Rafiamat Kidwai Memorial Award, of the CSIR in 1954 and DJ Watamal Distinguished Achievement Award in 1982. He was associated with various industries and published over 200 research papers in national and international journals. Professor Bhatt expired in the year 1985. So that was about the Professor J.V. Bhatt, in whose memory we have this lecture. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Requesting you now to uh, welcome and introduce our speaker for today, Professor. Hi. Can you help me? Your screen was visible. Ah, but uh, I was trying to. The presentation was not open. So you need to download the presentation. 
laptop it is downloaded i was trying to have my desktop screen Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, yes, we can hear yeah. you, sir. Welcome, yes, Professor please. Arun. Uh, and uh, this is the first time uh, the ABSD is uh, inviting you, and in future also you will be associated with us. And uh, the interesting topic uh, you have given us: hysteria monocytogenes, a global food safety concern. Professor Arun is a BVHC from uh, Kolkata and PhD. Those other details I will give you. And at present, he is a professor of molecular food microbiology at Purdue University, West Lafayette, USA. He received his university uh, degree from West Bengal and uh, University of Animal and Fishery Sciences. This is screen is on, Katri. PhD from University of Wyoming in U USA and postdoctoral training from the University of Arkansas, USA. He is a professor of food microbiology and in the Department of Food Science. He is also associated with the Department of Comparative Pathobiology, Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Diseases, Purdue University, Life Science Programs, and Pulse. He is chair of the Interdepartmental Food Science Graduate Program. His expertise is in the area of microbial pathogenesis. Hot pathogen interaction, probiotic bioengineering, and food bond pathogen detection. To date, he has co authored over 200 peer reviewed research publications, two textbooks, Fundamental Food Microbiology, Food Bone Microbial Pathogen Mechanism and Pathogenesis, edited four books, and delivered over 150 talks. Professor Dunya teaches graduate level courses on foodborne pathogens and mechanism of pathogenesis, microbial foodborne pathogen detection techniques, and intestinal microbiology and immunology. He served in the USDA National Advisory Committee on Microbiological Criteria for Foods from 2013 to 2017. He received Purdue Agriculture Research Award in 2003, Purdue Faculty Scholar in 2005, Purdue Team Award in 2006, IFT R&D Award 2009, Outstanding Graduate Educator Award at Purdue in 2013, wow. High End Foreign Ex Expert Recruitment Program, China. Fellowship from 2014 to 16 in Fulbright Specialized Specialist 2016 to 2021 and the Morris Weber Laboratory Award from IFP in 2017. He is serving as associate editor for many journals like Frontiers in Microbiology. Plus one, food, frontiers in sustainable food system, and BMT microbiology. So, floor is open to Professor Bunya to you, and welcome 
again to this our gathering of food scientists. Thank you, Subha. Thank you, so much, Dr. Kundekar, sir. And uh, Professor Bhumia, we are delighted to have such a celebrated scientist as yourself to come and speak to us about Listeria monocytogenes. Has always been a problem, continues to be a problem in the global food safety concern. We look forward to learning, uh, Dr. Mutan. Over to you. Thank, thank you, Subha. Um, thank you, Pro Professor Kondelkar. Uh, for uh, inviting me to be part of your, can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you, thank you for kind introduction. I'm glad to oh, be part pleasure. of your, um, you know, uh, memorial um, meeting. Um, it's a great honor to be part of this this organization and for inviting me uh, to give the keynote lecture on uh, listeria. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, excellent. Yeah, great. Uh, so, thank you again, uh, everyone, for joining uh, this evening. Of course, it's in the morning here. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, Listria monocytogenes. And obviously, it's a great tribute to uh, Professor J.B. Bhatt, uh, his pioneering work in uh, microbiology, uh, especially, you know, some of the metabolites and their impact on health. Uh, so it fits well within the theme of, you know, broader scope of uh, preventing microbial diseases and promoting uh, health. Um, so, so I started working on Listria monocytogenes. At least I was introduced in 1985 when I, when I moved to uh, United States um, and that some 30 years ago. And there was a huge outbreak of Listria monocytogenes in Los Angeles area. And that was from actually cheese. So it's a soft cheese called Mexican style soft cheese called queso fresco. Uh, essentially, they prepare those, those cheese out of raw milk. So as you know, raw milk sometimes is healthy, sometimes is good but it can carry a lot of pathogens. And so, so back then people had little knowledge about Listria monocytogenes. And so obviously this Mexican style ethnic cheese, they make out of raw milk. And so the cheese has not been processed in a way to inactivate Listria monocytogenes. So over uh, 142 people were infected and 62 people died. And of course, there are some uh, pregnant women uh, who had abortion of fetus. Uh, so Listeria, that's found to be deadly in both immune compromised as well as in healthy, healthy individuals. So I would say that was the beginning of a uh, beginning of research Area, era in Listria monocytogenes. And so United States government started spending a lot of money and efforts uh, since 1985. So that was kind of introduction to my research and we were looking at uh, preventing or controlling foodborne pathogens by using bacteriocins. And in the, uh, at University of Wyoming, I was working with Professor Bibek Ray and he was uh, looking at this bacteriocin research. And then I was suddenly interested to see if this bacteriocin can control uh, listeria growth in food. And so that's how we started. Then later on, uh, when I moved to University of Arkansas, we started developing detection tool for listeria. And at the same time also, I was interested understanding how listeria cause disease. Uh, so. So that's why I was very uh, fascinated by the, by the mechanism, how Listeria get to the, to the uh, gastrointestinal tract and eventually spread to different parts of the body. Uh, so I'm going to discuss a little bit about some of the pathogenesis related work. Um, so um, let me, uh, these are the topics I'm going to talk. 
touch base on uh, today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the biology and food safety issues. And then I'm going to cover a little bit about the pathogenesis of listeria, what we have learned in, from our research. And then is there a way we could prevent listeria mosaitogenesis infection in humans? And so as you know, probiotics is becoming very interesting areas of research. And we thought, you know, if certain approaches can be applied to control listeria. So I will end my talk with that topic. Uh, so before we go, I will, of course, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about history of listeria monocytogenes. Um, it was actually first isolated uh, in 1926 by E.G.D. Uh, Murray. Uh, that was in Cambridge, UK, England. And so that time listeria was actually causing um, uh, outbreak in laboratory animals, rabbits and guinea pigs. And so they isolated this organism and they called this bacterium monocytogenes. And in 1929, that there was a first report of Listeria infection in human. Um, in 1942, um, Piri actually, he changed the name from bacterium monocytogenes to Listeria monocytogenes in the honor of Sir Joseph Lister. Joseph Lister, he was a surgeon. And as you know, the aseptic technique, he came up with that technique during surgery so that we don't get infection. And so that's how the Listria monocytogenes name became um, uh, part of our organism's list. Um, and so monocytogenes comes from monocytosis. Those people who are infected, they show high levels of um, monocyte in their blood circulation. So that's the reason it was called Listria monocytogenes. And in North America, actually, we started seeing Listria outbreak as early as 1983. And I, as I said, that 1985, uh, US experienced the first uh, Listria monocytogenes outbreak in Los Angeles, California. Um, so this is the first paper uh, published by uh, Dr. Murray. And that's the report saying that the isolated bacterium monocytogenes. So let me give you a little bit about this organism. What do you know? Uh, so this is a gram-positive rod-shaped bacterium, about one to two micron. You can see the electron microscopy image of the of the listeria. Uh, it is non-spore former, but the, one of the interesting characteristics it grows in a broad temperature range. Um, so as low as one degree in the refrigerated condition to as high as forty-five degrees centigrade but it can also survive at higher temperature. It's highly motile. It expresses flagella. Sometimes the flagella could be temperature dependent properties, but nonetheless, um, it is helpful for bacteria to survive in the environment. And sometimes this bacterium can go under conditions called viable but non-culturable state. So essentially it pretend like it's dead, but it is actually alive. So that may, escape our ability to detect them from different food products or the environment. And other concern, of course, the biofilm formation. And that may be one of the characteristics of the bacterium to survive or persist in food processing environment or in the environment where uh, the bacteria can survive or present for years and years. And so that could be a continuous source of infection. Um, Listria monocytogenes, uh, this is pathogenic to humans, so that's the pathogen. And Listria ivanovii, this is also pathogenic species, and it infects mostly the animals. Uh, there are a lot of non-pathogenic Listria, and till today, uh, people are identifying or discovering a lot of new Listria species. So one of the interesting properties of Listria is that because they, they, are, um, they can be found in the environment, so they have a two life cycle or two lifestyles, we call them. And so one is called saprophytic lifestyle. That means they can be present in the in soil, decaying vegetation, silage. Silage is the one main source for animal listeriosis. Um, and then it can survive in the sewage and water. And so that's the saprophytic lifestyle. So that means they do not have to be pathogenic when they're present in that environment. But as soon as they are transferred to humans or animal host, they become highly pathogenic. 
and they have a different set of lifestyle. Um, so, so as it's mentioned, um, Listeria monocytogenes uh, is present, you know, ubiquitously in many environment, but animal is one of the main source, especially the meat animals. Um, so cattle, you know, pig, uh, chicken, you'll find this uh, pathogen in those in those animals. So they are actually called zoonotic pathogen. Means essentially, you know, these uh, pathogens can move from these animals. Uh, through meat or milk. And then of course, when they contaminate the environment, so you'll find them in the fruits and vegetables. And also you may find them in the soil, water, and eventually uh, infecting humans. And at the same time, also it can infect, you know, the pets, dogs and cats, they could be also infected. So, so the understanding this pathogen and where they come from, that become an important uh, knowledge foundation for us to develop methods to control those organisms. Uh, because if the pathogens come from these animals, we have to understand how to prevent the spread of those pathogens. And another place is the processing plant. So many of the food processing plants can have listeria. Uh, so, so especially with some of the outbreaks we had, these are with ready to eat foods. So most of you understand what is ready to eat food because you don't need any further processing uh, before you consume. Um, so many of the products being made, cooked and packaged, sometimes they can carry those pathogens and usually it's on the surface. Um, and sometimes maybe right after being processed and cooked, right before packaging, bacterium can get inside the package. And so therefore bacteria may not be inside the product but it may be on the surface. Uh, so that some of the problems um, um, USDA researcher found out that we need to control this post-processing contamination. And that often comes from the, the pathogen being present in the various equipment or the walls or the surfaces um, in the meat processing plant. So that's one of the source. Um, so before I move on, I want to just show you the animal listeriosis. And uh, listeria actually infect, like I said, it all different animals, including meat animals, as well as the pets and dogs. So you can see it, uh, sheep and goats and cattle, they get infected. So they would show similar symptoms like humans do. Uh, dogs and cats also, pigs, birds. And, and so in humans, we'll talk a little bit more about that disease. It causes meningitis, encephalitis, it infects the brain. That's where the organism moved to. And it can also affect liver. And in pregnant women, it cause abortion. And of course, some cases we have seen gastroenteritis. So we'll touch base on those symptoms a little bit more in detail, why dystria cause certain symptoms in humans. Um, so the continuing a little bit more about the, the listeriosis is we see in ruminants, especially cattle. And like I said, they are the main source of our uh, infection in humans because we consume meat and meat products. And also they can contaminate fruits and vegetables. Um, so in, in cattle, uh, silage is one of the major source. As I mentioned, the silage is actually fermented uh, uh, grass. Um, alpha alpha, for example, uh, they ferment it to lower the pH close to below five or 5.5. And if the fermentation is not properly done, so the pH <laughs> is over 5.5. And what happens is the listeria would grow and survive. And when the cattle consume that, and they can suffer from listeriosis. And so the through milk and meat, we can get the listeria. But when you see the symptoms in animals, as I mentioned, it can cause encephalitis and abortion, uh, septicemia, and animals actually cause circling disease. So they will go in circle because their brain is infected. And also you can see fac facial paralysis, abortion you'll see in uh, cattle and sheep. And then also eye infection can happen. And especially when animals are eating, uh, silage or grasses, and if they are contaminated, those cause injury to the eye and listeria can get to the eye. So these are a number of ways listeria can infect animals. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the food bond listiosis. As I said, I'm going to talk about the, the food safety issues and the concerns. So globally, Listeria um, infect about 23,000 people. And there are more than 5,000 people die of Listeriosis. In the US, uh, the numbers are a little lower, uh, about 1,600 cases and 1,500 uh, hospitalization. So what it means that anybody suffer from Listeriosis, we need to send them to the hospital because it needs immediate urgent care. And so that cost add, um, add cost to the, the patient is very expensive. And we have about 260 people die. And so the mortality rate close to 20 to 30%. So it has, a, it has the highest mortality rate among all the foodborne pathogens we, we know uh, because it infects immune compromised people, people whose immune system is weak and cancer patients and other uh, vulnerable high risk populations. Um, as you mentioned, the foods are the, the ready to eat foods and we'll talk a little bit more. Um, you know, you'll find them in the sausage, pate, salad, smoked fish, soft cheese, I mentioned, queso fresco, and ice cream, fruits, vegetables, and cantaloupe. Um, we talked with Dr. Kondelka about, about the um, 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 uh, cantaloupe outbreak happened in Colorado. And then also Poloni, I'll talk a little bit uh, in next slide. So the regulatory compliance, US and Brazil, we have a zero tolerance for Listeria monocytogenes in food. Um, so that means if we're ready to eat food, contain a single Listeria monocytogenes cell, you cannot sell that product for human consumption. So the food has to be recalled, food has to be condemned. Um, so that's our strict regulation, FSIS, and US government strictly follow that. And for that reason, we have now uh, one recall from um, Tyson chicken. They have recall, they are recalling about 9 million pounds of ready to eat chicken product. It's happening right now in US um, because of this zero tolerance policy. In Canada and Europe, their rules a little bit relaxed. They allow less than 100 colony forming unit per 25 gram. Um, I would say that's still not a good limit. There should be zero. It's because we'll see in a minute that Listeria at very low infectious dose can cause disease. And so I'm not really sure this is a good idea to have some Listeria in the food. And there are immune compromised people who are highly susceptible to this infection. So economic cost about $2.8 billion. That's how it is uh, calculated in US. Uh, food recalls, loss of lives, medical cost, medical bills, lawsuits. So number of issues that really adds to cost to this, to this uh, Listeria monocytogenes outbreak. Um, uh, around 2004, 2003, 2004, Food and Drug Administration in US, uh, they looked at those foods and they categorized what are the high risk food for Listeria and what are the lowest risk. And so I thought their study was um, excellent and maybe this needs updating because we have found a lot of other foods can belong to different of this category. So if you look at the food which are at highest risk, like daily meats or frankfurters, those are not e heated. So those are the foods I mentioned a few minutes ago, like sausage. Um, and then dairy products, that's a high risk. And then there's some of the moderate risk products also you'll find some of the fermented products, semi-dry products, low water activity products, salmonella, uh, listeria would not grow in those products. And all the, the cheese, those are hard cheese. Um, so those are moderate risk. Low risk, obviously fermented food, right? Raw seafood and very low, low risk products. So this will give you some idea of what food presents the highest risk and how to handle that. And if you are highly susceptible, high risk category, maybe you should be able to avoid certain type of foods to avoid Listeria infection. Uh, so this is the outbreak, uh, Jensen Farms outbreak in uh, US in 2011, 156 people were infected, 32 people died, one miscarriage. And queso fresco or soft cheese, there are many outbreaks happened uh, since 1985 in US and still it's a problem because reg people still use raw milk, even though they are prevented from using raw milk. And, and that may be the major source for listeria. 
And 2017 and 2018, about two, three years ago, uh, South Africa actually suffered the highest, uh, largest number of people suffered from listeriosis. And their outbreak happened due to this sausage called poloni, and it's beef, pork, meat. And there was about 1,000 cases, people were infected, and 218 people died within that two, two years. And that was the largest outbreak recorded in the, in, the, in the history of listeriosis around the globe. So you can see it can strike any time, any country, if you are not prepared. And it affects, like I said, children, elderly, immune compromised people, and the mortality could be high. And it has a huge economic impact. So if some countries think that they do not uh, experience listeriosis problem, as the food modernization happens, we are producing food in a factory and large volumes, and it's distributed to so many people around the country, around the state. And so there is a great chance if you are making a product and if that get infected, contaminated, that can uh, you know, uh, affect so many people. And so we have to be really uh, you know, highly uh, preventive mode or control mode so that we can avoid this type of uh, major outbreaks. Um, so this, this shows the list of different outbreaks in the US. Uh, you can see it from 2012 to, to 2021. I don't want to go through the list, but you can see so many outbreaks still happening. You know, no matter how much money we are spending, we can still see different types of food products uh, being um, infected or contaminated by Listeria monocytogenes and affecting so many people and so many deaths. Uh, so this is still a continued problem. So we have to figure out how to control this. Um, so the major challenges with the listeria, so as I said, is ubiquitous existence. So that means you find them everywhere, in the soil, in the water, in the environment, and animals are major source. Also humans, we also carry this organism. So we can also contaminate product or be source of this infective agent. Growth and survival at broad temperature range. That really makes it very difficult. So if you have a product, you store it in the refrigerator and they can survive and they will grow. So your refrigeration is becoming ineffective in terms of controlling listeria. Um, so their number would increase in the refrigerated condition. Adaptations to stressors. And this organism we found out, it can withstand a lot of different stress whether it's acid stress, you know, heat stress, um, you know, pressure, or any other processing conditions we are using to control them, they can adapt very well, they can survive. So eventually they become a problem as soon as they arrive in the, in the consumer's body or the host. And of course the persistence I mentioned a few minutes ago about the biofilm formation and then the mixed culture and the viable but non-culturable state also help them to be maintained in those different environments. So we looked at, for example, they're making you know, biofilm with the antibiotics. Our group, we try to control some of those biofilm formation. And also we use some antimicrobials and technology approach to control them. And I'm not going to talk about that, but these are some of the side projects we looked at how to prevent biofilm formation so that we could control Listeria infection. So um, another area also we looked into is that why Listeria is such a problem, you know, like the stressors I mentioned a few minutes ago. So one thing we, we discovered, or it's known to most microbiologists, is that we try to control them by organic acids, salts, refrigeration, desiccation, heat, and antimicrobials, uh, vacuum packaging, right? Remove oxygen. So you create anaerobic environment so the bacteria do not grow uh, because these are aerobic organisms, spices, essential oils, uh, fermented foods as microbes. So all of those conditions in the food is present to prevent listeria growth or survival. But what happens is that some of these conditions can help the bacteria to become adaptable, to become robust. And if you look at the, the environment in the intestinal tract, and we also carry similar type of conditions. 
So you can see the acids, antimicrobials, um, you know, low acidic environment, oxygen deprived conditions or anaerobic conditions, antimicrobials, natural microflora, immune cells, all of these present in our digestive tract, they can also have similarity with the food environment. So what essentially I'm trying to say is that when Listeria is present in food, whatever conditions we made, we help them to prepare better so that by the time they arrive in the human host, they already adapted to survive well in the gastrointestinal tract. So therefore, our, our physiological conditions, which are in place, cannot control or prevent Listeria spread. So essentially food environment, food associated stress, help the foodborne pathogens to survive well in the gastrointestinal tract when we eat them. So we wrote a review article and essentially, you know, it tells you that you prepare these microorganisms so then they can adapt very well in our gastrointestinal tract. So that's, that's really a problem. So we have to be careful, the processing conditions or treatments we are using to control these pathogens, in a sense, we can, we can make them even worse, you know? So we have to be careful um, how we um, design our experimental conditions or the treatment so that um, these path pathogens do not become problem. It's like antibiotic resistance. You know, you expose them at lower level, they become highly um, resistant to certain antibiotics. So eventually you will not be able to control them. So the processing conditions may change the microbes in a way it will be very difficult to control them if you cannot kill them uh, entirely. Okay, so uh, my lab, besides those what I discussed, uh, we, we did some work on the bacterial detection. Um, right now we are not focusing as much, but we are focusing a little bit more on the listeria, how it causes disease. And if you understand that process, probably you may be able to come up with a strategy to prevent this listeriosis in humans. So that way it can also um, be effective in controlling and preventing listeria infection in humans. And recently also we started looking at the drug delivery. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, but essentially listeria can provide a way to help transfer listeria through our uh, gastrointestinal tract or the drug delivery where it's a problem in the oral drug delivery. So let me talk a little bit first about the pathogenesis. I'll go briefly over that. And understanding that knowledge can help you uh, prevent this infection by using probiotic approach. So before we get to that, just to give you general approach is that Listeria, so it's a foodborne pathogen. And so if it is present in the food, and once it goes to the gastrointestinal tract, and in the gastrointestinal tract, it rarely causes gastroenteritis, although we are seeing more cases of diarrhea. Listeria is not known to cause diarrhea, but we are seeing some people suffering from uh, gastroenteritis or diarrheal diseases. Um, Listeria, after the GI tract, it passes through the, the wall and gets to the lymph node then gets to the liver, spleen, and eventually it gets to the brain. It infects brain. And that's the reason we see meningitis, encephalitis. And in cattle, the animal go in circle if their brain is infected. And then in pregnant women, it crosses the fetoplacental barrier and infect the fetus. And the fetus can be infected, can be killed. So there would be abortion. And this is pretty common in Listeria outbreak. Uh, pregnant women, um, you know, uh, have a premature birth or abortion or stillbirth. Um, so that's a that's a sad situation uh, for Listeria outbreak. So that's called invasive Listeriosis, and then the abortion and neonatal Listeriosis involves, like I mentioned, and also um, are serious disease due to foodborne Listeriosis. So knowing this, um, so if you look at the infectious dose for gastroenteritis, generally it requires higher number of bacteria. Um, as high as 10 to the power 10 colony forming unit. So that's a lot of bacteria in the food. 
<clears throat> usually it takes about 24 to 48 hours to show symptoms and it's a febrile gastroenteritis you'll see abdominal cramp nausea vomiting you'll have some watery diarrhea headache joint pain and it's usually self-limiting means you suffer from this disease and it cured by itself so you don't have to worry about it but if you are immune compromised you fall under this high risk category elderly or infant or the pregnant women, an immune compromised condition, it become invasive. So that's a danger. And sometimes medical doctors do not understand that process and therefore they will be misdiagnosed. By the time they say, oh, it's a gastroenteritis, maybe salmonella, maybe campylobacter, maybe other organisms which are known to cause diarrhea. And they would never suspect that this is because of listeria. And so if you do not diagnose for listeria and then it become invasive, and the people who die. And so these are the problems associated with misdiagnosis of listeriosis. In invasive case, so infectious dose could be very low. Like I said, less than 100 cells. And usually it's immune compromised, uh, pregnant women, um, cancer patients. Um, these are all the high risk group. So you'll see flu-like symptoms, abortion, premature labor, miscarriage, stillbirth. Uh, fetus would suffer from sepsis meningitis, encephalitis, bronchopneumonia, hepatitis, and mortality rate is pretty high, 20 to 30%, like I said before. So a high rate of mortality in invasive listeriosis. So the question we keep asking, of course, you know, that we eat food and if listeria is present, how do they cross the list gut barrier? And so that's the important question. Because remember, they need to get to the blood circulation, get to the brain, to in order to be effective. Um, so as I said, let's look at the gut barrier a little bit. So if you have listeria in food, and like I said, physiological barrier, I mentioned a few minutes ago, that we have in saliva, we have stomach acid, antimicrobial conditions in the gastrointestinal tract, micro, natural microflora, they are all in place to prevent pathogen survival and growth. But we still get infection. Then let's look at the physical barrier. So physical barrier means the, the intestinal architecture. So if you look at the, the small intestine or large intestine, so small intestine, we have a villa structure, then we have epithelial cells, um, then we have a goblet cells, this secretes mucus, and these are all designed to prevent any pathogen entry from the lumen into the, into the GI tract. Um, in, into the, the blood circulation. If you look at uh, the, the villa structure in, in mouse, this is from your physiology anatomy um, study, and you can see the architecture. So these are the epithelial cells, and these white circles, these are actually goblet cells, which secretes mucus. And once the mucus is secreted, it creates a hole, and sometimes pathogen can get through this. That's one way bacteria can get in. And so this, if you look at this another picture, so these are the two epithelial cells, and this is called epical junctional complex. Just to simplify this, this process is really complex because these are proteins holding this structure together. And so the bacteria or any other microbes present in the lumen, they cannot go into the blood circulation. This is how they're naturally designed in the host. <coughs> Excuse me. And so if you look at the electron microscopy image, I'm just going to show you a little bit so that later on you will understand um, how the probiotic can prevent this. So this is the called tight junction area. This is one epithelial cells. This is another one. And these are the called junctions. And this is the microvilli. And if you look closely at ultrastructure, this is how this look like. And there are a number of proteins called occludin, claudine. These are the tight junction proteins. These are the called e-cadherin, catenin. These are the, some of the proteins involved in this junction. So essentially, think about a cloth, piece of cloth you are wearing, and the stitch, right? The thread holding this two piece of cloth. And so these proteins, essentially, uh, this is holding them together. So two epithelial cells, one this one and the other one, and they hold them together. So think about it. The piece of cloth, you know, you are using thread to uh, hold them together. What happens if you remove those thread? It will open up, right? So sometimes these epithelial cells, 
if this bacteria, a lot of those foodborne pathogens, they manipulate these proteins. They will break this protein down and therefore this opens up. So it open a hole, bacteria would go through. And that's a clever strategy. So we are trying to figure out if Listeria use that pathway. And these are the different staining procedure to show these proteins are present. These blue are actually nucleus of the cell. And this is like E. cadherin, large protein here. And later on, you'll see this bacteria, what it does, it removes those proteins from the membrane. It's like removing the stitch, the thread, and then it opens up. And then the bacteria would get in. So this is, this is kind of like in the lab, you can see this. This is the epithelial cells we grow in the flask. And this is the microvilli, listeria monocytogenes try to get in. And you can see it already close to be getting inside. And this is got inside. Because these are called intracellular bacteria. They need to get in. If they're inside, then the immune cells cannot see them. And it can, it can be protected from antibiotics, immune cells. So that's how this listeria is so clever, can cause infection. So these are actually large number of proteins involved in listeria pathogenesis. It doesn't really depend on only one protein, like internalin protein is involved in listeria invasion. These are other proteins. So one of the protein we are working called LAP, listeria adhesion protein. And that binds to call heat shock protein 60, that's the receptor. So that's where we will pay attention to. So briefly, this listeria adhesion protein is called enzyme. It's called alcohol acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And this protein is produced by listeria. And our, our lab uh, was the first to report this, that this protein uh, has a alcohol dehydrogenase and acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. This is an enzyme actually called housekeeping enzyme produced by listeria and is, is helping the bacteria to cause infection. And this is what we are trying to find out. This shows the location of the protein on the bacterial surface and a little bit more about so we, we ask this question, is this the protein help listeria to cross the epithelial barrier? Uh, so around 2010, my student, Christine, she was the one first to report that, that this protein, listeria adhesion protein, actually induces intestinal epithelial permeability and listeria translocation. So this is a in vitro model. You can set it up in the lab. You will have epithelial cells. They're growing in this little tray and there's a filter underneath. So the bacteria on the top, if they cross through and then you can count them, how many bacteria passing through. And so you can measure this dye, FD4, translocation, bacterial counts. These are the way you can find it. Then later on, we said, well, let's look at this protein if it is involved in translocation through the epithelial barrier in the mouse model. And so you can gavage. Um, these animals are infected with listeria and you can gavage them with the dye, FD4. And four to five hours before you kill the animal, you can inject this dye and then look at the dye in the serum and urine. So does it open up this epithelial barrier so the bacteria can go through? Uh, so um, Rishi, uh, one of the graduate students in my lab, uh, we published a paper 2018 and it shows that listeria adhesion protein or lab it induces intestinal epithelial barrier dysfunction for bacterial translocation. So this is a huge study. And we looked at the molecular level and cellular level, how this protein really opens up the tight junction and allow the bacteria to go through. So I will share only a few slides to demonstrate that. So we created lab mutation, means the bacteria do not produce lab. And this is the wild type. And if you look at the, in the mouse model, in the lumen versus the lamina propria. So the bacteria is crossing this barrier. And so you can clearly see lab mutant strain has much lesser numbers. So this implies the lab is important for crossing this barrier. If, it's <clears throat> if lab is absent, of course, you will not see any bacteria going through, very few bacteria. And this is another protein which is well known for involved in the uh, invasion. So that actually also not participating in epithelial barrier crossing. And you can look at the whole bacteria animal study. Like I said, if you feed the mice with the listeria, with the wild type and lab mutant, you can clearly see less bacteria in the liver, less bacteria in the spleen, less bacteria in the mesenteric lymph node. 
both 24 and 48 hours later. So this clearly says that LAP is involved in bacterial crossing through the epithelial barrier. And essentially we want, we ask this question, what is the mechanism? What is the, uh, the mechanism how Listria actually open up these two epithelial barrier junction? So this is a classical uh, call, uh, pathway where it causes leaky gut. Remember when you suffer from diarrhea, usually essentially what happens, our epithelial barrier become very leaky. You know, and so the bacteria or the water could lose from the body. And so TNF alpha, which is one of the cytokines, inflammatory cytokines, it activates NF kappa B, it called myosin, activate myosin light chain kinase, which in turn actually controls all those proteins I showed you a few minutes ago that actually hold these two epithelial cells together. We thought maybe our lab doing similar uh, mechanism to open up this tight junction barrier or making it leaky gut. So Listria addition protein binds to heat shock protein 60. It activates NF kappa B. It activates myosin light chain kinase. And what it does actually, it pulls these proteins away from the membrane, like removing the thread from this two membrane, and then it opens up the tight junction. And that's essentially what he found out. So next few experiments should show that indeed the NF kappa B is activated. And these are the protein levels. You can see they are decreased. And then in the mouse also, another experiment we did, we use called MLCK knockout mice. MLCK is very important enzyme, help that protein to be hold together by two cells. And if MLCK is absent, so those proteins are not going to be regulated by lab. So essentially that's what he proved that if you use a MLCK knockout mice, this wild type and lab mutant has no effect. They have a similar response when they move to liver. Whereas MLCK positive, which is our wild type mice, the lab mutant, you saw that their numbers is very low. Similarly, spleen, mesenteric lymph node, uh, lamina propria, you'll see low, low level in the MLCK positive mice, MLCK knockout also reduced. So essentially this series of experiment telling us that lab opens up this tight junction barrier and allow the bacteria to go through. And this is the permeability marker. We looked at the serum and the urine. Um, so this is the protein level analysis. So this picture showing that this occludin, claudin, E. cadherin, the Listria monocytogenes at wild type, they remove those proteins from these junctions. You can see the E. cadherin disappear, whereas the lab mutant E. cadherin is present. So what he's saying is that wild type Listria monocytogenes remove those proteins from the junction, whereas the lab mutant preserves it. So what it means, LAP is involved in this whole opening of this tight junction barrier. And, and so the model we came up with without going much detail, just showing that Listria monocytogenes expresses LAP, it interacts with heat shock protein 60, it activates this series of pathways, ultimately activating myosin light chain kinase, and this open up this epithelial barrier. Now, once you have a pathway is like a door open, Listria can easily pass through quickly. So think about it from the standpoint of food you are eating with low levels of Listeria in it. As I mentioned, infectious dose could be less than 100 cells. If you eat less than 100 cells, most of the organisms do not cause disease except Shigella. Shigella is highly infectious. That's why you get Shigella bacillary dysentery which is endemic in uh, Southeast Asia. And so same way Listeria with low infectious dose because it can open up this tight junction, it can easily cross through. And what happens, this happens so quickly, your immune cells don't see it. And so therefore there is a greater chance of getting infected by the uh, immune compromised people uh, readily by this pathway. So this kind of open up the door for Listeria to go through quickly at a low infectious dose. And so that's our contribution to science, understanding how Listeria actually open up this junctional barrier to cause infection in high infectious, you know, high risk people. 
So these are actually summary of that uh, pathway. So Listeria open up this pathway called translocation. And this can open up another way so that they can get inside the cell. And this is goblet cell or mucus. It opens up this bacteria can go through. M cell also is called another pathway bacteria can go through. So the food you eat is contaminated with Listeria and number of ways they can pass through. So how do we use this information to prevent Listeria infection? That's the key challenge, right? I mean, I explained to you a lot of details of the molecular mechanism, cellular mechanism. Then you might ask, so what? You know, that's a big deal, you know, you found the mechanism. But then we were interested, how can we use that knowledge to prevent Listeria infection? Okay, so, so then we ask this question, can we use probiotic? I guess I don't have to introduce this audience about probiotic. Right, we are interested. Can you use a probiotic from a store? If you go to a store, probably I guess in the US, you know, if you open TV and uh, looking at TV channel and any program, you'll see so many probiotic advertisement. And I was just sitting on the computer and pulling out what are those different probiotics and who is selling. So many companies selling probiotics, and it's a multi-billion-dollar industry right now in the West. You know, Western countries. Now they are under figuring out that, oh, probiotic is good for your health, you know? And I know in the Asian countries, we used to eat that all the time. Every morning or every evening you wake up, you eat probiotic, you know, yogurt, you know, cheese, fermented products. That's part of our life back in, in India or Asia. But in US it's not. So we are getting into Western country, getting into more probiotic culture. So. Well, if you take any of this probiotic, can any of those prevent your Listeria infection? That's the question we asked, you know. That'll be great if you take a probiotic and you take probiotic daily and you find out, oh, yeah, it can, it can improve your general health, but is it possible it can prevent Listeria infection? Uh, so so we, what we did, we did a, a simple experiment. One of my students did that. So we used Lactobacillus rhamnosus, Lactobacillus acidophilus, Lactobacillus paracasii. These are some of the common probiotic bacteria we have in the milk and dairy products. And none of them actually prevented Listeria interaction um, with, uh, when you use the in vitro cell model, KECO2 cell model. There's no competitive exclusion, no inhibition of addition, no displacement. So this is Listeria count by itself. And after they exposed to the probiotic, they have no effect. So then I said, well, let's try if you can change this, if you can make this probiotic work against Listeria. So then what we did, can bioengineer probiotic lactobacilli spe targeting specific host receptors prevent Listeria infection? So what we did, I, I want you to focus on this one, not, not this one. This is the HSP60. That's where Listeria adhesion protein binds. You saw this slide before. So what we want you to do is that if we take this lab protein, which helping Listeria to interact with this receptor to cause infection. Now, if you take this protein and put it in probiotic or lactobacillus, and then instead of Listeria, lactobacillus would bind to this receptor. And let's see if that can prevent Listeria infection. So this is exactly what we started. And so to simplify this process, we took this lap gene. And one of the things I didn't mention before, lap gene is present in both Listeria monocytogenic, which is pathogenic, and Listeria inaqua, which is a non-pathogen. It has also the same protein. But for evolutionary purposes, somehow this lap protein is non-pathogenic in this organism. It doesn't cause any infection. It doesn't cause any disease. And so therefore we took that protein from both monocytogenes and Listeria in aqua, put it in a vector, the gene, and then transfer that into this Lactobacillus KGI, which is one of the good probiotic. And then we created this bioengineer Lactobacillus. And so we put that gene proteins, these are the proteins from Listeria monocytogenes and Listeria in aqua expressed there. And so these are our bioengineer probiotic, we call it BLP. One BLP is expressing lab from Listeria monocytogenes, one expressing lab from Listeria in aqua, which is non-pathogen. And then of course we'll use our uh, original 
Lactobacillus my wild type. So we recently published this study in uh, Nature Communication. Again, Rishi and um, um, uh, Marianne was initially involved in creating this. Um, and then Rishi actually completed this study. It was just published in December issue in 2020, uh, about six, seven months ago. And so here I will just show you a little bit of data showing that that lactobacillus, the bioengineered lactobacillus, these are the two lactobacillus, BLP, they are expressing lab, whereas the wild type, it naturally doesn't have lab. That was the purpose. And so in this, in this uh, confocal imaging, it's showing that this bacteria expressing this lab, okay? Whereas this, this um, wild type lactobacillus do not express this protein. This is just a visual evidence that it is expressed on the surface of lactobacillus. That was our goal. And then first question we asked, do they uh, do they bind? Do they adhere to the KCO2 cells? If you look at this BLP, two of them, they had a stronger adhesion compared to your lactobacillus wild type. So you can see significant increase in adhesion. Do they invade? They do not invade, even though they are carrying Listeria monocytogenes uh, protein. Do they translocate? Means go through in between cells. They do not. So that's a good news. So back, lactobacillus we created with this Listeria protein, they are non-pathogenic, at least what we are showing. Now, next question we ask, do they prevent Listeria monocytogenes in the in vitro cell culture model? So you can clearly see the LM are not adhering or invading this KCO2 cells when they're exposed to bioengineered lactobacillus, BLP. So there is no LM detected on these cells, whereas the wild type showing very high level. Same way they protected invasion, protected Listeria monocytogenes translocation. So what we are showing, this bioengineered probiotic in vitro on a cell culture model can prevent adhesion, invasion, and translocation. So infection can be blocked. So we also confirm that probiotics also bind to the receptor, HSP60, because that is the key because the lactobacillus binds to the receptor on the epithelial cells, it would prevent Listeria monocytogenes from infection. So this data actually is showing that by using uh, KCO2 cell line, which do not express HSP60, do not have, we created this cell line. And so we showed that it's a HSP60 receptor specific. Then we said, well, let's do a mouse study, see if we can prevent Listeria infection in animals. And so we fed this mouse in a water for, with the uh, uh, probiotic for about 10 days with wild type and bioengineer. And then after two, day, after two days after you know, completing this um, feeding with uh, probiotic, we killed the animals and we, we, we sacrificed these animals and we collected their organs to assess the levels of Listeria in those different organs. If it is protected, you'll see low level of Listeria. And so that's essentially what we did. And we also looked at immune response and if there is protection, the, what is the mechanism behind this protection? Um, so first data will show that this probiotic, bioengineered probiotic now can colonize better in the mouse, even in absence of listeria. You can see great colonization, increased colonization in those. And we also showed in the, in the cell staining model uh, it's called fluorescent in situ hybridization. Uh, you can see high levels of um, bioengineered probiotic on the epithelial cells. I think the best picture would be this. You can see bioengineered probiotic, you can see making direct contact with the epithelial cells. And both of them, you can see they have created called biofilm like structure. They have you know, colonized the whole epithelial surface. Whereas the wild type, you will not see any probiotic here. So that means we are able to ma make them bind to the epithelial cells. And now if they are infected, obviously it can prevent Listeria uh, colonization. Uh, so next, next I'll show you a video. I think that will give you a good proof. Uh, so this is the control. This, this mice were infected by Listeria monocytogenes. They haven't received any probiotic. And so these animals after 48 hours, you can see they are very sick. And this is how mice, when they're infected, they look like this. This group received only wild type probiotic. It's not, it's just a regular probiotic you will consume. So both of them showed similar symptoms. 
means these animals are highly sick. Now we look at, let's say, these are the bioengineered probiotic or BLP fed mice. They're challenged with the listeria. So now you can compare between these two that these are highly active, the animals look pretty healthy. And this is another one, the probiotic um, expressing lab from Listeria in aqua, non-pathogenic bacteria, and you can clearly see these animals are highly active. And so this gives you a good idea that probiotic work very well. So we looked at their animal weight and we looked at their survival and we found actually 92% protection against listeriosis. So this is, this is the one only few mice died, but the other ones, you can see they are all, you know, very high mortality. So this was very convincing for us, the bioengineered probiotic we created, it was able to prevent listeriosis in mouse model. And these are just the proof that we're looking at listeria counts in those intestine, feces, mesenteric lymph node, blood. We could not see any listeria in blood when they were fed with the probiotic, bioengineered probiotic. Same way we see very low level, even some animals did not see any listeria in liver, uh, spleen or kidney. So we got a very good protection against listeriosis in these animal models. And so the next we looked at the, asked this question, you know, besides protecting, colonizing, on the surface, do they do immunomodulatory function? And we looked at in depth. If you're interested, you can look at this paper. We looked at CD4, regulatory T cells. This is the dendritic cells, natural killer cells. Their levels are all up very high. And these are known to prevent listeria infection. And so we got a solid or robust prevents, preventive strategy from the immunomodulatory function uh, uh, in those animals, therefore we were able to protect this host against infection. So that was very good. So the next we looked at, can this prevent listeriosis in pregnant animal? Because remember pregnant humans are highly susceptible to listeriosis. We are thinking if pregnant women during pregnancy period, you know, if they take this probiotic, can they prevent, um, you know, listeria infection? And so what we did actually, guinea pig is a good model. And we used pregnant guinea pig. And um, Valerie was responsible for this re, uh, research, my student. And what we found out actually, we fed the guinea pig for, uh, for about uh, 17 days, 14 days. And these animals, when they are in their gestation period of 24 to 8, 28 days, is equivalent to human pregnancy. This is how we, we calculated. And then we challenged these animals with listeria and Listria colonized well. We showed that by counting them. And what we, what we looked at actually in the mother, we, we see Listria in mother, okay, that's, that's there. Uh, but what is most interesting is that we did not see in the mother's blood, mother's lungs or kidney, but also same time, we didn't see any Listria in placenta as well as in the fetal liver or in the brain, of course, we didn't see anywhere, but the fetal liver. So what it's saying is that placenta, we didn't see any listeria. So it's preventing or blocking fetal placental transfer. I showed you that picture before. And so if you look at also some of those path gross pathology, so this is a wild type listeria, wild type probiotic with listeria monocytogenes. These are fetuses are all infected by listeria monocytogenes. This is bioengineered probiotic plus listeria monocytogenes you can see the different color. If you look at the fetuses, and this fetus, you know, is highly infected, and this is not infected. And so it's clearly demonstrating that it prevents fetal infection in pregnant guinea pig. So there's a good possibility to work very well in human system as well. Uh, just to give you some idea that it not only prevent listeriosis in healthy individuals, also can prevent in pregnant um, cases. So to summarize the mechanism, so what do you think that as you feed the probiotic to the host, so we believe it expresses lab bioengineered probiotic and it binds to the receptor HSP60. When it binds, then if the listeria monocytogenes comes in, it has no place to interact. So that's a competitive exclusion. And also 
binding of probiotic, it also improves barrier function. Your gut barrier become very tight. So it's no more leaky gut. That's the benefit of uh, probiotics. And also, as the probiotic binds, also it shows anti-inflammatory response. I did not show you this data, but these are the data already it reduces TNF alpha, IL-6, um, in, uh, also increases IL-10. These are the good uh, cytokines, you need them. But these inflammatory cytokines are decreased. So that means less disease caused by Listeria for having this uh, by BLP. And also it causes immunomodulatory response, T-reg cells, these are the all regulatory cells. They provide actually good protection, solid protection. So what we understood now, this bioengineer probiotic system not only improves gut health, also can help prevent Listeria monocytogenesis infection. So in conclusion, so as I said, Listeria monocytogenesis is deadly in immune compromised people because of the high mortality, 20 to 30%. And LM control, of course, should be a high priority in food industry because a lot of ready to eat foods are carrying this organism. And also the high risk people, elderly people, cancer patients, pregnant women, infants, newborn, they are the high risk group in the society. And we need to really protect them. Many of them die off because of this disease. And a lot of times because the doctors cannot diagnose on time. And so that may be another reason why we have a high mortality rate with these infective agents, even though antibiotic therapy works very well for this treatment. But I think misdiagnosis uh, is the main concern for uh, high fatality or mortality due to listeriosis. And as you mentioned, lab interacts with the receptor and it activates NF-kappa B MLCK pathway for Listria translocation. This is actually first report from our group showing that Listria uses this pathway. This was not reported before. Um, and we can take advantage of that mechanism to create bioengineered probiotic. And we saw it prevents infection in mice and pregnant guinea pig. And I already mentioned the mechanism of action. It's a competitive exclusion, improved epithelial barrier function. It also modulates immune response. And potential application, as I said, you know, can we use this probiotic in pregnant women or elderly people? Uh, prevent colonization in meat animals. The animals are the source of listeria. If you can reduce their level in the, during animal production, can it improve gut health? Can you reduce antibiotic use? So a lot of times we use antibiotics to control pathogens in meat animals. If you use probiotics instead of instead of antibiotics, maybe that's helpful, you know. And similar approach can be used for other infectious diseases, you know. Think about all those other uh, pathogens causing disease. Can we use probiotic approach, especially bioengineered probiotic approach? With that, uh, this is my group. Um, they were last year um, and few of them graduated, they moved on. We get a lot of international students as well as domestic. And so these are my group. A lot of visiting scientists come from different countries as well, Turkey, China. Um, and so different country actually come here. Also, we have a lot of Indian students, as I said. Um, these are some of my collaborators uh, and these are some funding agencies. And we do collaborate with a number of people from around the country as well as internationally. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge their contribution. I'd like to thank you for, for listening to my talk. Hopefully it gave, gave you a little bit more information about Listria monocytogenes, um, how, how bad it is or what can we do? Because knowledge is the power and hopefully that can help us to take care of this problem in future. Thank you very much. So nicely explained. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to, you know, yeah. answer. Hi, uh, this is Ritesh Mathur here. It's so wonderful to hear you, sir. Like it was really thorough. Like when I I was just seeing it in a speechless. Like it was so mind mind blowing. I really enjoyed the way you explained the the history, how it started in 1926, and the history how how the bacterium become the Listeria monocytogens. And I, the one thing which I really like, I'm learning first time, the way you explain the mechanism, the example giving the cloth, how the cloth get peered and how the bacteria get in, that was wonderful. I never heard about this story or this, the way of explaining the way you, you mentioned about that. It was so wonderful. 
ஒரு <laughs> 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 really enjoyed like uh, listening to your session and i was getting like getting some messages from my friend who in between and they were all like mind blowing this is this is what we look at something and this is like a i enjoyed my friday evening seriously with you like it was so thorough and so much so much thankful to you and dr kondika sir uh, for like suggesting your name i mean this was really really interesting i mean i'm getting so much i mean getting so many messages also coming here uh, from all all our fsc and all other participants and Can everybody else so and th- thank you thank you very much i mean that is the whole purpose hopefully i was able to enlighten you today a little bit about listeria and the uh, the excitement it created in our lab and I, i'm glad to able to share that with you you know and you feel feel the the same way so we are we are extremely passionate about this pathogen you know i think the way i explain best is that this is um, this this gave me the job listeria monocytogenes you know that's <laughs> essentially my livelihood you know it pays for my bill and house and everything so 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 because these are nasty organisms and we need to study and that justifies our survival as well you know it's kind of funny how it works dr, dr. arun yeah, yeah. please so, dr yado uh, one question are there any attempts to commercialize this bio engineered probiotic lactobacilli uh, yeah that's a, that's a good great question we just received a patent on this that was uh, just approved and um we are looking for opportunities for other people to use or commercialize it um we'll see how that goes uh, but one of the concerns i haven't mentioned that as soon as you mentioned about the gmo or genetically modified or bio engineer mm-hmm. uh, that may have a different regulatory hurdle to overcome uh, but i did talk to many people who are very optimistic because you know we still use a lot of bio engineer um, you know drugs or agents for example insulin you know uh, insulin is not naturally produced right it's produced by e coli so bio engineer means and so so there are opportunities to change that rule or relax that rule in certain situations do you want to die of this disease or you want to have something that is known or proven to show some benefit to the the general people you know uh, so there are actually favorable view because many people are working on this type of approaches by engineered approach and you know approaches by engineer provide you to control aids hiv or many diseases infectious diseases and uh, so I, we are pretty optimistic that that can be overcome at some day and uh, so people are trying to market this as you call live biotherapeutics you know but it's a next generation therapeutics and uh, so these are some of the opportunities we have to take advantage to make this available to general people if it can be helpful i know those are some limitations but you know it's probably need of the hour or alternatively we may think yeah. of some mutagenesis you know uh, instead of going to rdna you know yes, go for mutagenesis uh, mutant of lactobacilli who can be effective against it something like that i don't know you are the yeah. better yeah so so far we don't see the way it is created yes but we have to look at more in depth in general you know understand this process because the beauty of this is that this specific protein also present in lactobacillus this is a housekeeping enzyme you need that every bacteria need alcohol acetal dehydrogenase de- only certain sequence is different slightly and that really provide that uh, opportunity for bacteria to use it and listeria for example listeria monocytogenes use that as a mul- we call it moonlight protein so it's an enzyme it's needed for its survival under anaerobic condition uh, when there is less oxygen it's a source of energy uh, but at the same time uh listeria use that to attach to the host so it's like a need of the hour 
So when it is infecting, I need this. If the other pathways are not available, it can use this pathway to get into the host. But think about non-pathogenic listeria, it lost it. It doesn't, it doesn't use that pathogenic property, but it does use that as an energy harvest. Uh, so we are taking advantage of that fact, taking this gene from non-pathogenic listeria and put it in the probiotic and showed that it can, um, can have the similar effect. We can control the pathogen. So that's another beauty of this, this approach, um, non-pathogenic protein. So. Thank you so much, yeah. Doctor. It's really enlightening and wonderful work. Oh, thank, thank you very much. much. Yeah. I don't know. I want to. Uh, Sir, we have one more question uh, from Doctor Vinda. You want to say yeah, something, ma'am? Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ma'am, I can read for you in case. Uh, want. Can I speak, sir? Can I speak? Yeah, ma'am. Ma'am, please go ahead. Ma'am, please yeah. go ahead. Yes, yeah, sir. We have been working for uh, in Listeria for the last say around a decade now, and. We have done an epidemiology of listeria from all types of food. And as you reported, there are less uh, low risk as seafoods, but we are getting a lot of uh, listeria as far as Kerala is concerned, especially in case of prawns and uh, shrimps and squids, we, are do, we do get listeria. So I think there's a difference in the temperate and the tropical uh, uh, pattern as far as uh, organism uh, epidemiology is concerned. That's a, that's a really great point, though. I mean, when I was looking at that list, because that was made in 2004, and I was thinking that this list needs to be changed. And also other issue is that this is from the U.S. perspective. You know, um, we get a yeah. lot of uh, seafood-related listeriosis, usually the smoked seafoods, uh, seafood, you know. Mm. Um, not necessarily the raw, because, you know, of course, some people eat certain raw food. Um, they've been tested before they are, you know, used. But I agree with you, you know, um, that that list, I think it has a lot of U.S. perspective rather than the global perspective. Yeah. And that the other condition yeah. you mentioned, that, that's true. The conditions, they are harvested, they're grown, uh, they're stored and shaped and all kinds of stuff, how it is handled, you know, a lot of those factors. Yeah, I, 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 I disagree with that list in that man in that uh, the list yeah. i provide i said it needs revision that's for sure but that's how we started at least we have to start somewhere you know and that yeah, gives yeah. Some perspective. So another, go ahead yeah so another thing i want to add uh, as far as i have been working on listeria is that mm -hmm. we get it from dry fishes and i suppose it is because of its halophilic nature that we are getting dry fishes we are getting a lot of listeria monocytosis yeah, that's because that's... we do sun dry and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, we I do sun that's... drying and then, and then so that I wanted also... to just add as far as yeah, we, we add salt also, yeah. yeah, so we do get that. Sir, another thing I want to ask whether we you have been working on any plant extract uh, effects on listeria, plants extract um... now, a lot of focus is on. No, no, I think there are a lot of studies done or there are people are doing that. A lot of plant extract, especially yeah. phenolic compounds or there are a lot of antimicrobial yeah. stuff. Yeah, the spice, spice extracts, mm. they're effective. But I yeah, think yeah. only concern I see that time to time is that the amount needed to cause the inactivation, we may not have that. And by the time mm. you add too much of those extracts, mm. the flavor would be so awful. I don't think people would like to eat or drink, you know. Um, so I think that's the, yeah. that's the issue with that. But in laboratory conditions, I have seen highly effective against uh, Listeria monocytogenes, many of these plant extracts. Sir, one more thing, one, if, we, if uh, time permits. Uh, Listeria inocua, we have been lately getting HLYA gene, which is uh, which usually we used to get in Listeria monocytogenes. So yeah. can we still uh, take Listeria inocua as uh, non-pathogenic? I think HLOY is one of the factors and you know that, I mean, it has to go through all those other stages. This alone cannot yeah. make it uh, pathogenic, um, especially, you know, if, if, if it gets into the cell and yeah, it can get out of the vacuole, but it will not yeah. survive in the cytoplasm because of the autophagy and all those other system can take care of this bacteria. Yeah. So it, it would end its yeah. life cycle right there. So just having HLOY gene alone, I, I doubt it. It's going to be that problematic. 
but i think you need to be watchful in future see if any list in, in aqua strain i think there was a report also there was one list in aqua not only hly i think they found other genes as well you know um, yeah, so, yeah 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 i have um, stopped yeah that's right so in general it's not but i think through evolution and genetic uh, modification some of those organisms can acquire some of the other virulent genes you know because listeria inaqua and monocytogenesis yeah. they don't have much difference except only this this pathogenicity island cassette you know other than that everything is so similar yeah yeah okay well, thank you for thank the thank you sir thank you for the informative talk yeah, yeah. thank you so it was a very mesmerizing talk huh? professor Abba. i can say in one sentence very went well very well oh thank you very much yeah. any other questions comments suggestions okay Could, any more questions for for the session yeah uh, can i ask a question yeah please go ahead yeah uh, uh, this is siddharth singh from uh, school of agro and rural technology iit guwahati uh, sir uh, thank you very much for this uh, insightful and uh, rather inspiring talk uh, so i have a question uh, what is your take on uh, using this uh, uh, sort of competition strategy using a species like lactobacillus to control uh, this organism in fermented food products listeria uh, control so so you are suggesting if we use this bacteria of say yeah. say for example um, lactobacillus um, mm -hmm. and if you use that for fermentation yeah i think yeah. that that if it can I I don't know about this this lactobacillus KGI we used. I don't know how well it can mm. use as a fermentative product. You know, initiate a fermentation. I was thinking we could use this and uh, in a fermented product like yogurt, right? Add this mm -hmm. after the product being fermented and made, and add this mm. bacteria and see if that can be served as a places where you know you don't have a preservative i mean refrigeration or transportation in yogurt or you know similar crap product you could deliver uh, but if you want to express similar gene in an organism which is directly responsible for fermentation and i think that should mm -hmm. work as well we haven't tested anything like that but uh, in my mm -hmm. i mean the way the mechanism works i think it should be it should be um, it should work I mean, I don't see any okay. reason why you not reproduce the similar result with another pathogen or another organism, another oh. lactic acid bacteria. Okay, uh, and that and would be even so, that would be even better than the just the probiotic. You know, if it cannot probiotic, cannot produce a fermentative end product. You know, or cannot ferment the product, mm -hmm. and so you have to go through mm -hmm. two step process. And I think that's what many people are trying to do. but if it can directly ferment mm -hmm. the product at the same time you have this beneficial effect that would be great mm -hmm. right uh, and sir uh, one more question i have uh, mm -hmm. when we are shifting to this uh, cold chains especially nowadays in tropical countries also we are seeing particularly countries like india we are seeing lot of uh, these eateries are coming up who are serving this uh, paneer kind of dairy product in chilled condition so mm -hmm. do you think that has a uh, a uh, a possibility or there should be a cautionary thing for uh, listeria uh, infection absolutely um so what is the ph of that product I... do you know the uh, ph it's near that? neutral it's yeah so that should be a major yeah, concern yeah it's uh, near neutral products yeah so that should be a concern you know if it is not fermented product you know mm -hmm. i mean paneer um so if they are going through the cold chain i would be worried about that uh, because it's a dairy product right. and the environment is perfect for listeria to survive and grow and i don't know how much i mean i know a uh, lot of publications i see from india but i'm not mm -hmm. really sure if the regulatory compliance or what what the what the guidance you know um uh, like here you know any products um they are You, I mean, selling it. Of course, you have to check for listeria, and they will specify mm -hmm. that these are the guidance. And as you know, it's a zero tolerance for us. Uh, so this is strictly uh, um, enforced all the time. Mm 
about the zero tolerance. So I don't know about the Indian uh, regulation and the standard of those listeria. Uh, but I, I, in my, in my opinion, yeah, that should be tested for this organism. You know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yep. This is really a wonderful talk, sir. Oh, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. And any more questions? Uh, Dr. Bandika, sir, you have, you have like worked really hard on like your work on the studio housing. You want to speak something about this? I hope Dr. Bandika is there. We think Dr. Check. Shukla Hello. Shukalpur wants to ask something. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Excellent uh, talk, uh, Professor Dunia. Uh, and uh, uh, the information about pathogenicity of the mechanism and your bioengineered uh, lactobacillus is really good and I hope it works in uh, because in immunocompromised patient there is a big problem right yes will yes. this uh, bioengineer thing work there well that's what we that's what we believe it should have the similar work um, action and it's, it should work very well for immune compromised people because um, if we were taking uh, competitive exclusion as the major mechanism, and you really can take advantage of that situation to prevent listeria interaction and colonization. And at the same time also, you know, I mean, we know that lactobacillus by itself can modulate immune system. It has a general health beneficial effect. So we are using two properties at the same time and that's the reason we use lactobacillus. People might ask, you know, why lactobacillus? Why not something else? And being in food science department here, always I've been thinking, what is the food components we could deliver to a patient where that could be effective? You know, if I'm in the medical school, probably I would be thinking about developing a vaccine, but vaccine against listeria, I don't think you are ever going to get vaccine against listeria. There is a reason for it because it's not, economical or commercially viable for any pharmaceutical industry to take on because they want to make money, right? They want <laughs> yeah. to apply to everybody. But in this case, it's immune compromised, high risk people, how many people get infected? But those who are infected, they get sick very easily and many of them die because of the high mortality rate. Uh, but to start with, I think that's the limitations of creating a vaccine that would be useful. So for us, I thought, that will be a better approach if you come up with lactobacillus, which is part of the food ingredients. People can take it now. Probiotic, you know, everybody wants to use probiotic. So that was the that was the thought process about you know when I was starting here at Purdue, and when I started working on Listeria monocytogenesis pathogenesis, and that's when I started thinking of using lactobacillus at some point. And so when our research on pathogenesis become mature, that's when we said, okay, now let's put that gene in lactobacillus. We didn't start that way. We, we started to understand, first try to understand the mechanism. And once we understood, then we thought we could engineer it. Otherwise I could have started that, you know, when we started working with Listeria um, because we didn't have the background information to make it effective. Uh, and so no, I think that's how all, it worked out. All those studies and results you showed that uh, they are very clear and they definitely work in animal model and that cell line model, definitely. I was just wondering about the humans and mainly the immunocompromised ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. but I think, excellent I, work, yeah. Yeah, I think we use the pregnant guinea pig and if we use a uh, immunocompromised mouse, probably we'll be able to show that. But yeah, I think next next attempt would be if we can have a, you know, some human study, you know, clinical trial or somewhere along that line. Uh, but first would be probably in the in a larger animals, you know, yes, ruminants, yes. domestic um, animals. Uh, because sometimes uh, some dog owners would call me and they would say, well, their dog had uh, listeriosis, you know, because the pets are very dear to many people. And yes. we, I had so many conversation because I'm veterinarian, I, even though I don't practice it, but people would ask those type of questions because listeriosis is a problem in animals and so pets also. And so sometimes the animal mm -hmm. feed have a listeria contamination and then the pets would be infected. So we had last year, I think this year also, the pet food got uh, recalled or contaminated with salmonella. 
and we had yeah. also listeria. And so we just don't think about human food, also animal feed also get contaminated. So in those cases, probably this type of approach would work. So we are keeping our eyes open and see you know, if animal industry want to use it in their feed and uh, to prevent listeriosis in those animals. So that would be first um, effort. And then the second effort would be, of course, human applications. So, so we'll yeah, see yeah, it. that that will be the way to go. Uh, thank you, thank you for excellent talk and very good informative. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, sir. It was wonderful to hear from you again and all question answers. Uh, there were some some messages came from the I think the student community. So we are not sharing any of the certificate this time, but we'll be sharing the links to you uh, and also for the feedback link. So please share that. And uh, with that, please allow me uh, to close the session. So it's so, so wonderful to hear you. Um, it's my gratitude and, and thank you so much for the session. And again, thanks to Dr. Kondeka sir for inviting you. Like this was like a catalyst for us. Uh, and it was so wonderful to hear you. Uh, so on behalf of FST Mumbai uh, chapter, like uh, we want to say a word of thanks to you. Thank you so much, sir. And we look yeah. forward to hear more from you in, in future. Like we, we will invite you for the most, most of sessions uh, in, coming, in coming days. Thank you. That will be great. Thank you, Ritesh. Um, um, yeah, maybe in person sometimes I'll go and visit you next time when, I, when I'm in India. Um, Please, thank sir, you again for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. And thank you, uh, Dr. Kondeka, for, you know, thank studying you. everything, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> it, was, it was a great, great experience for me also. Great honor to be part of your society and celebrating Dr. J.B. Bhatt's, you know, uh, birthday or his his accomplishment throughout his life. So obviously they are the pioneer and set up the stage for us to be successful. So I hope you feel the same way too, you know, I see Subhaprada and all of you are doing a great job in your organization. So stay in touch and keep us informed if we could help, you know, that's our job to help you guys, you know, <laughs> to be successful next, you know, as you, as you move on. So. Yes, true. Sure. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. session. I think. So, just uh, I think Dr. Shukriya from Jabalpur uh, has raised his hand. So, did you want to share something, Dr. Shukla? Dr. Shukla? Okay. Must have been an so um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bunya, Dr. Kundekar, uh, all of the participants who joined us, all our seniors from headquarters as well. Uh, Ritesh was actually on a holiday in Lonavala, but uh, oh, uh, chose to funny. join. <laughs> <laughs> but I see. For the association. Uh, thank you all. There were some questions uh, about the e-certificates. This is not a program which we had organized for a certificate. So uh, there are no certificates will be given. But uh, we will be sharing the feedback link. We would like to hear back from you as well. And uh, Dr. Bunya, sir, we will share the feedback uh, with you as well once we receive it from the participants. Excellent. Thank you very much once again for your time. Oh, for your information, two of my students uh, joined from Virginia's Institute of Technology. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Yeah, no, they have joined already. They were there. Because in the morning, I gave them link and they have joined. So, very, very nicely spread news about Professor Dunia's achievements all over the world. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh